Good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon for me. For many of you, it'll be morning or even late in the evening. I'm Margaret Stanley, and I'm the president of the International Papillomavirus Society. And as most of you will know, our major activity as a society is, is our international meeting, which we hold every 15 months or so. Uh, the next one is in 2021, when we hope we can all meet face to face in Toronto. But 2020, we had to have a totally virtual meeting, which was a really new experience for many of us, but was actually very successful. And one of the things that was commented on again and again in the feedback from our delegates was the quality of the science. And we thought we would um, extend that by putting on a set of webinars. And these webinars cover the three topics which were seen, which were attended most frequently online and was seen by people as being absolutely key to understanding what's going on. And the first of these webinars is given by a friend and colleague of mine, John Dorbar. And John is a true expert. He's an expert and he is the person I think who's generated most of the insight into how the life cycle of papillomaviruses is enacted, the differences uh, between high and low risk viruses, and the contribution made in virus um, pathogenesis to disease formation. And more recently, he's been looking at immune control. So he's gonna to talk to us for the next 40, 45 minutes on understanding disease formation, immune control, and carcinogenesis for HPVs. John, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, hopefully everyone can see and hear me okay, and welcome wherever you are. So yeah, I'm gonna give you a talk which was based on the presentation I gave at the IPV meeting, uh, which would have been in Barcelona. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about papillomaviruses uh, how they cause disease, including cancers, and how they're immune control. And the talk's going to be in a number of different sections. I'm going to focus predominantly on high-risk papillomaviruses and their biology, but I want to reflect a little bit on what marks them apart from the vast majority of other papillomaviruses, which are classified as low-risk or low-risk of causing cancer. I also want to introduce this idea that the epithelial site matters and that there are lower risk epithelial sites where cancers occur infrequently and higher risk sites such as the transformation zone of the cervix and the oropharynx. And towards the end, I'd like to introduce the concept of immune control of the virus and explain what happens in the vast majority of people who become infected because cancer is actually a rare outcome of an infection by these viruses. So let's take a start by looking at papillomavirus particles. This is the uh, human papillomavirus. And of course, the virus particle is what protects the viral genome when the virus is outside of the cell. And the papillomavirus particle is very simple. It consists of 72 capsomeres, each one made up of five molecules of the major coprotein L1, and the minor coprotein L2. Now, what's inside the virus particle is what really matters. In the case of papillomavirus, this is DNA. And it's a double-stranded circle of DNA, which is shown here in this electron micrograph. And of course, in the real virus particle, uh, this piece of DNA is wrapped up with cellular histones to make a tight bundle, which just fits inside this particle. Now, papillomaviruses, they're epitheliotropic. They live their life in the epithelium of the body. And there are many types. And many of these papillomaviruses have now been completely sequenced, completely DNA sequenced, and they have a very similar genetic organization, a common organization, which I'm going to describe. They all have a control sequence of about 1,000 base pairs. And within the rest of their 8,000 base pair double signed circular genome, they have a series of gene products. And these gene products eventually take over the cell and allow the cell to make new virus particles. And what really matters when a virus gets into a cell 
is how the viral genome expresses its viral genes. And there are a complex pattern of gene expression because the different gene products are expressed by complex splicing patterns. And so there are very many more gene products than there are genes. The pattern of gene expression determines the phenotype of disease and also the specific viral gene functions. And these specific gene functions vary from different papillomaviruses. And to a large extent, these gene functions underlie the different tropisms of the different papillomaviruses. Now, I mentioned that there were at least 200 human papillomaviruses, and this is an evolutionary tree showing them. And at first sight, this looks very complicated, but it's not quite as bad as it first looks. There are two evolutionary branches of papillomaviruses, one that comes down here and that comprises the beta and gamma types. And I won't mention these much until towards the end of the talk. And another branch which goes up here to the alpha papillomaviruses. And the alpha papillomaviruses are medically the most significant. And within the alpha papillomavirus group are the low risk papillomaviruses, which cause genital warts and the high-risk genital papillomaviruses, which cause cervical cancer or pharyngeal cancer. And within this high-risk group are HPV type 16 and HPV type 18, which are the most important of the high-risk types because together they cause more than 70% of all cervical cancers. Now I'm gonna just show you a little bit of information to explain the difference between high and low-risk viruses. And I can do this by showing uh, virus infections of the same epithelial site by a high-risk virus on the left and a low-risk virus on the right. So this is infection of the cervix, and we can clearly see if we look at these three biomarker stains, which I'll use a few times throughout the talk, there's a, quite a difference between these two viruses. Now the stains I'm going to show here are MCM, which is a cellular replication protein which marks cells in cycle by the red stain. E4 is shown in green. This is a viral protein involved in virus transmission and is generally expressed in cells which are supporting viral genome amplification. And the blue stain is just a counter stain to show the positions of the nuclei. Now, after infection of the epithelium by a papillomavirus, the virus uh, genome becomes resident in the basal cells of the epithelium. And one of the things the high-risk papillomavirus does is it stimulates cell cycle entry in the basal cells. It also stimulates cell division, which you can see here by these mitotic figures. And low-risk papillomaviruses over on the right do this very poorly. They're very poor. Uh, they have a very poor ability to drive cell cycle entry into the basal layer, but they do drive cell cycle entry into the upper layers. And this is cell cycle entry but not cell division. And all papillomaviruses drive cell cycle entry in the upper layers so that they can amplify their viral genomes to high levels. Now this is about gene expression and protein function. And for the high and low risk viruses, we know quite a lot about the differences in viral protein functions. So these are some of the key binding targets of the high and low risk papillomaviruses. I just wanna focus on one or two of these. The E7 protein of the high-risk viruses bind the whole family of this protein family called retinoblastoma. And the retinoblastoma proteins are proteins which control cell cycle entry. And the high-risk viruses bind and affect the function of all members of the, high, of the retinoblastoma family. The high-risk viruses, but not the low-risk viruses, also affect a class of proteins known as PDZ domain proteins. And these proteins affect cell density and cell polarity. And by affecting these, they control the normal regulation, which tells a cell whether to grow or whether to stop. And quite importantly, I'll come back to this a little bit later, the high-risk viruses direct the degradation of this key cell cycle regulator, P53. And all the low risk, and although the low-risk viruses also affect P53 function, they don't affect it so dramatically. Now, this is uh, how the virus changes the molecular pathology of the epithelium that it infects. But an important point is that although high-risk viruses can cause these effects, they don't have to. 
And they can also cause lesions which resemble low-risk virus lesions in terms of their molecular pathology. I'll show you one here. So this is a high-risk HPV infection. This is a CIN grade two. This is also a high-risk HPV infection, and this is a flat lesion. And the difference between the two is the difference in viral gene expression. And it's the difference in the expression of the viral E6 and E7 genes. Now, the transcript maps of papillomaviruses are very complicated, and there's a lot of different ways in which different gene products can be expressed. But the disease phenotype is, to a large extent, mediated by these two gene products, E6 and E7. And there's a difference between these two different types of lesions, and it's a difference in gene expression. So let's have a look at how the virus wants to express its genes if it's going to make new virus particles. Now, this is an in situ hybridization to show where viral transcripts are. And this is a very, uh, very nice technique because we can detect E6 and E7 transcripts in formal and fixed paraffin embedded tissue. Now on the left here, we've done a stain and these little brown dots just show the presence of a housekeeping gene to show that this particular lesion has intact RNA. But on the right, we've stained for the viral E7 mRNAs, the E7 message. And I want to just explain this in the context of a couple of viral protein functions, the cell cycle regulator RB and P53. So if you just look very carefully, you see the virus is expressing some E7 in the basal layer and also some E6, and it's affecting these proteins, causing slightly increased cell proliferation and also affecting the differentiation of the cell by affecting P53. And also this protein, it's a component of the notch pathway, a, rec a, replication, uh, a regulatory pathway which controls differentiation. And you notice that the cells which are about to leave the epithelium seem to have a low level of E6, E7. E6 and E7 come on very, very high in the upper layers of the normal infected epithelium if the virus is going to be productive because they're important for viral genome replication. So there are two stages in the virus life cycle where the virus needs E6 and E7. And it's thought that neoplasia is a consequence of deregulated expression of E7 and also E6. Now we can look at this by looking at a cone biopsy. And this is a biopsy of someone who is treated for high-grade neoplasia. And this has also been shown, stained to show the presence of E6, E7 RNA. Now it's very hard to see at this magnification, and you can see it a little bit better in the high magnifications, but I've ordered these just to show you how the expression changes in different grades of neoplasia. So in a cervical neoplasia grade one, E7 expression in the lower layers is very, very little, and you can see it being expressed for genome amplification. If you go to a high grade neoplasia, you can see this uniform expression of E6 and E7 throughout the epithelium. And this expression is manifest in terms of the proteins, the molecular pathology of the lesion, because there's a lot of cell cycle replication going on here and very little in the productive infection where we get E4 and MCM just for genome amplification. So that gives you an idea about where E7 is. We can also look at E6 and actually E6 is a very interesting protein because it affects the amount of P53. And if we look at uh, productive infection, low-grade neoplasia, and high-grade neoplasia, we see this progressive loss of P53 from the basal cells, and the blue counter stain shows through. So by affecting the levels of P53 and cell cycle regulators, it's very easy to see how this virus ends up causing neoplasia. Now, there's a very important additional point which relates to P53 in that in the normal cervical tissue, P53 is quite abundant anyway. And it's often said that P53 has a role in preventing cell cycle progression or apoptosis in response to the presence of E7. But I think this may not be totally true because in many epithelial sites, P53 has a fundamental role in controlling keratinocyte differentiation through the notch pathway. And I think we have to suspect that E6 affects the epithelial differentiation pathway by affecting P53. And this is one of its key functions. 
And when we think about what P53 does, it's regulating the loss of cells from the base left. So we can think about these two viral proteins now and put them back in the context of epithelial regulation. So if we think about the normal epithelium, what happens is that cells divide in the basal layer of the epithelium. As cells become more and more packed, they eventually get pushed out of the base layer into the layers above. And as they do this, they undergo a process of differentiation. And this balance in the basal layer between proliferation and differentiation is homeostasis. And very small changes in this balance can have very important consequences. And what papillomaviruses do and make very small changes in this balance. So low risk viruses can affect differentiation, but not massively affect cell division. And they lead to the formation of papillomas. High risk viruses affect differentiation and they also cause sustained proliferation. And I think through these routes, they give rise to neoplasia. So this gives us a basis of how the virus work and how they cause serious disease. And I think the next question is, how does HPV gene expression become deregulated? Why should this happen? Well, I think we can gain an insight into this by looking at the different epithelial sites where high-risk papillomaviruses cause neoplasias and cancers. And they cause genital infections and they cause cancers at these sites, but not equally at all sites. So although high-risk HPVs will affect vaginal, vulval, and penile epithelium, they don't cause cancers so frequently at these sites as they do when they infect the cervix, the anus, and also the oropharynx. And it's particular epithelial sites within the cervix which are problem areas. So we can look at this now by considering some of these epithelial sites and focusing on penile lesions and ectocervical infections. These two sites are differentiated multi-layered squamous epithelium. These are good sites for the virus to go through their productive life cycle. And if we look at the lesion of this site, this shows the edge of a lesion, the edge is marked here. This is a low-grade lesion caused by HPV-16 at the ectocervix. And if we put some of the markers on that I've talked about, we can see cell cycle entry marked here in red, followed by expression of E4, as the virus goes into the late stages of its life cycle. And the virus causes cell proliferation in the lower third, genome amplification in the middle, and the production of new virus particles at the surface. This is a successful productive infection for the virus. And this underlies the appearance of the usefulness of biomarkers for understanding uh, a cervical disease and neoplastic progression. I think the issue really comes when we think about other sites and particularly the transformation zone of the cervix and the endocervix, because this is where the bulk of the cancers arise caused by these viruses. And the transformation zone of the cervix, the cervix in fact is a very complicated type of epithelium. It's made of different types of epithelial structures. This is the ectocervix. This is the multi-layered epithelium where the virus can be productive. But there's also the transformation zone in the endocervix. And the endocervix is a columnar epithelium which would normally not support a productive life cycle. And the transformation zone is a type of epithelium which is produced at puberty by a special type of stem cell called the reserve cell, which normally sits under the endocervix, under the columnar cells of the endocervix, which drives the formation of a multi-layered epithelium at a particular stage in a woman's life. And there are other cell types in this type of epithelium, such as specific cells of the junction, uh, which may also be infected. So why do we think the virus can infect epithelial cell types other than those which are appropriate to allow productive infection? Well, this is a comb biopsy, a beautifully cut one, from someone who had a range of different infections. And this is a H&E stain. Before we did this H&E, we stained with one of our favorite cell cycle markers, the one I showed earlier, which stains for MCM, a cellular replication marker. Now the blue here is a counter stain, which shows you where the nuclei is, and this magnification you can't really see very much detail, but the red shows, shows cell cycle activity. And in the normal squamous epithelium, 
this is confined to the basal layer of the stratified squamous epithelium. But as we head up the endocervix and to the uh, columnar epithelium, we find there's an unusual area of activity here. And this is stained with MCM, but we can also stain it with P16, which is shown here in green. And many of you might know that P16 is often considered to be a, a, a diagnostic or a suggestive marker that a papillomavirus might be involved. So one side of the endocervix is staining P16 positive. And we can look at this in a bit more detail here in a higher magnification, and we can put the cell cycle marker MCM back on. So this isn't a multi-layered epithelium. This isn't an epithelium which is undergoing normal differentiation. And this isn't an epithelium that could ever support a productive papillomavirus infection. But the virus has got into this epithelium and is causing a thin cervical neoplasia. And the normal uh, pathology of the, of, of the tissue has changed remarkably. And this is because the deregulated expression of E6 and E7. There's no virus production here. And even if we look at this area of virus infection here, where there's some degree of differentiation going on towards the center of this crypt, there's very, very little genome amplification. There's never any virus particle production. So this suggests that the virus can uh, enter inappropriate cell types and cause problematic disease. I focused a little bit initially on the reserve cells and the reserve cells are this special type of stem cell which underlies the formation of the transformation zone. And in the next image, I can show you one or two very beautiful pictures, which give us an idea about what the virus might be doing when it gets into reserve cells and cells of the transformation zone. So this is the junction between the stratified squamous epithelium of the ectocervix and the transformation zone. And there's a number of different areas of metaplasia here, which I'll come and focus on. The P16 stain is just used as a quick and easy stain to give you an indication about where its virus infections are. And we've also stained this piece of tissue with a marker of the reserve cells, shown here in green, this is keratin 17. And I just want to enlarge this box here to reveal one or two points. So the reserve cells are shown here in green, and here we have a metaplasia in the process of occurring. And here we have a metaplasia which is getting close to be completion. We have the multi-layered epithelium building up and the marker of reserve cells start to decline. But here we have an area where the reserve cells appear to be trying to produce a metaplasia, but it's not working quite as normally. And this is an area of virus infection. And you remember earlier, I said that E6 affects epithelial cell differentiation it leads us to suggest that the virus gets into these inappropriate cells and suppresses the normal differentiation process. There's another area over here, which is also quite interesting, reserve cells, virus infected cells, the differentiation process appears to be suppressed and it seems like the virus infected cells are spilling out sideways from the area of infection. Now, if the virus can affect a number of different cell types, we, we eventually lead to what happens when it gets into endocervical or cells of the endocervical sites. And here we see a, a cervical crypt, uh, which appears to be infected with the virus. And you can see that the crypt has become very, very folded, presumably because the virus gene expression is affecting normal cell-cell regulation. And then instead of stopping at a normal cell density, the, uh, the crypt is becoming extensively folded. And here cells from the crypt are starting to reach the surface, but they've been washed away during the fixation process because the normal cell-cell contacts are not, not as robust as they normally are. So if you've got any doubt that this is virus infected, we can look a little bit more closely and use our RNA in situ approach. And this shows that these little green spots indicate viral gene expression in these abnormal cervical uh, columnar cells. So we get this type of model now where we have three different epithelial sites of the cervix. And the idea is if the virus infects the ectocervix, which is a conventional epithelium, which is made up of basal cells, which produce transit amplifying cells, which eventually differentiate, then virus gene expression is more likely to be normal and we're more likely to get a productive infection. We then consider the transformation zone where are the special cells called reserve cells, which can build a metaplasia. 
And the build in metaplasia when the cervix becomes irritated, when there is inflammation, when there is a need for a protective barrier. And these reserve cells start to reconstitute the normal epithelial layer and build up a stratified squamous epithelium of the transformation zone. But presumably they have a different regulation than the ectocervix. And if the virus enters these type of cells, the idea is that their gene expression is different and they end up being manifest as a high-grade neoplasia, a SIN2, which can eventually progress to cancer. And we have to think about infection of other cell types, such as those at the endocervix or the reserve cells which are not undergoing metaplasia. And I think the idea here is that we can get high-grade neoplasias very soon after infection if the virus infects sites like this. And we can extrapolate this model from the cervical transformation zone to the anal transformation zone, and even to other epithelial sites where the virus causes neoplasias and cancers, such as the tonsillar crypt and the oropharynx, where the tonsillar crypt cells have a very unusual organization. This forms a reticulated epithelium, and uh, there are lymphocytes going in and out through a semi-porous basal lamina, and presumably here, virus-infected cells may be able to move in and out through this layer too. And when we look at where the virus is, well, the high-level gene expression in the P16 resides within the tonsillar crypts. So I think we have a model here where viral gene expression, if it's correctly organized, will give rise to a papilloma or a flat ward, depending on what type of virus it is. And that if it's a high risk virus and we get persistence, persistence because of an immune defect, a failure of the immune system to resolve infection, then over time, if the virus is in a cell type where gene expression can be deregulated, we have a very simple route towards cancer, where the virus stimulates the accumulation of genetic errors, which eventually lead to the cancer phenotype. Now, in the last 10 minutes or so of the talk, I want to move away from cancer because we, the cancer progression is a, a rare outcome of this very prevalent virus, of this very common, these very common infections. And in most people, this isn't the root that the virus causes. In most people, the immune system does actually work and the virus is recognized. And this may take some time because the virus has a lot of immune evasion strategies but eventually the immune system will see the virus and disease cleared. So the vast majority of people who become infected will end up clearing their disease and not having a cancer progression path. Now, it's very important to understand what could be happening when disease clear is cleared. And I think I want to start to introduce the idea that disease clearance seems now to be disease control or more precisely, immune control of infection rather than true clearance of infection. And I want to pitch this by just thinking about how we have thought of this in the past and maybe how our thinking is changing slightly. So I want to move now from considering the biology of the virus in the cell to the biology of the virus uh, over a woman's lifetime, the natural history of infection during the whole life of an individual. And we know that the virus infections occur at the onset of sexual activity and the virus is transmitted as a sexually transmitted virus. In most individuals who become infected, their infection is recognized, immune regression occurs and disease is cleared. And it's been thought in the past that if a new HPV is detected, this corresponds to a new infection, either to a type they've had before or to a new type. Now, this model, this simplistic model, the field has had quite a lot of difficulty in fitting this model to the observations. And I just want to show you one result from one paper, but there are many results which follow this type of trend. When we look at the detection of new HPVs in someone who who has had disease previously, in over 80% of cases, this is in either in sexually inactive women or women who, have, who don't have a new sexual partner. 
And so it's hard to understand how new HPV infections can occur in this setting. And only in around 20% of individuals does new infection occur or new detection occur in women who are reporting a new sexual partner. So we maybe have to think a bit more insightfully into what's really happening here to try and link the observations with what could be happening. And when we think about many other viruses which cause chronic infections, such as the herpes viruses, immune regression and disease clearance doesn't necessarily mean clearance of the infection. And we have to think along these lines now, the clearance of disease doesn't mean clearance infection, but more realistically, it's immune control of the infection, immune control of viral gene expression and immune surveillance. So if we think like this, a new infection, a new detection of HPV could well be a new HPV infection or an infection from a virus which they've not seen before, but it could equally likely be changes in the immune status leading to a controlled virus becoming apparent. And this re redetection of a HPV type, which has been brought under control by immune system may eventually be seen at the clinical level, if the level of DNA rises above the clinical threshold. So why would we think that human papillomaviruses can be controlled by the immune system during someone's life? Well, I just want to give you a couple of examples from different areas. And the first of these, I wanna move from the alpha HPV types to the beta and gamma types. You remember at the start, I spoke about these and said these are very ubiquitous viruses that cause cutaneous skin lesions. And everybody will have these HPV types on their skin. And because you're immunocompetent, they won't manifest as any disease. In fact, a good place to find beta and gamma types are in plucked hairs and in plucked eyebrow hairs. And what we've got here is a hair follicle, a punch biopsy of a hair follicle from someone who has a HPV, a beta HPV infection. This is a hair follicle here. This is a hair coming towards you. This is a sebaceous gland. The tissue looks broadly normal, but if we stain for markers of virus infection, well, here's some L1 showing here in green towards the hair. And here's some E4. This is a virus which contributes to virus particle production. So this is an infected piece of tissue, although it looks apparently normal. And this is an immunocompetent individual. In immunosuppressed individuals, then the virus can do a lot more. The virus can get away with expressing its genes at higher level. So we see pictures more like what's seen in the here with lots and lots of E4. This is another one. And uh, you can get virtually every cell around the hair follicle expressing the viral proteins and the lesion can spread. And this is actually a basal cell carcinoma arising in the vicinity of a beta virus infection in an immunosuppressed individual. So we get the idea that immune surveillance controls HPV gene expression. And if immune surveillance changes, then viral gene expression has to be suppressed. And if you lose your immune surveillance, the virus can get away with doing more and will become more apparent. Now, this is a beta papillomavirus in humans. We can also look at an immunocompetent animals at animal model systems. And this is a rabbit model, which we've used in the past. I just want to show you something very similar now in an immunocompetent rabbit. So these are lesions caused by rabbit oral papillomavirus on the tongue of a domestic rabbit. And because we induce these experimentally in naive animals, we can follow the course of infection. So after infection, disease occurs, in this case, papillomas, within five or so weeks. And because these are no naive animals, there is no immune surveillance. There's no immune system to notice the virus and the virus goes unchecked. After five weeks, the immune system starts to notice the virus is present. Lesion regression occurs. And we get a situation where we move to immune surveillance and virus control. And this can occur for months or years. And in the rabbits, we can experimentally immunosuppress the animal a year or so later after the initial infection. And we can use laser capture microscopy to take pieces of tissue out and to look at what's happening to the viral genome copy number. So if we follow viral DNA copy number, 
After four or five weeks, copy number rises because we've got a productive infection. As the immune system kicks in, the virus is brought under control and the copy number declines. And even a year after the first infection, if we immunosuppress, we can see viral copy number rising, suggesting the virus is present in a controlled manner. And when we change the immune surveillance environment, viral gene expression can increase once more. So we can put this into the context of what we think might be happening in the cervix when there's an infection and when there's infections cleared. So here we've got a virus infection and I can show this animated. And we've also got immune cells in the skin here. These are Langerhans cells. And although the virus actually has many immune invasion strategies and it's hard for the immune system to notice, eventually the immune system does track it down by cross priming presumably of viral antigens onto Langerhans cells. And the Langerhans cells notice the viral antigens and report these to the local lymph node. So, just, yeah. So the Langerhans cells take the viral antigens to the local lymph node. In the lymph node, they present the viral antigens to the T cells. The T cells become activated and presumably they return or home to the site of infection. And as they enter the site of infection, um, they produce cytokines. So they, they start to accumulate at the site of infection. Some of them will penetrate through the base of lamina into the lesion. And the idea is that the, as they appear and start to deal with the infection and change the cytokine milieu, this change in the milieu, cytokine milieu affects viral gene expression and viral gene expression subsides as the lymphocytes arrive. And this gives you a situation where the presence of memory T cells, which know where the virus is and know what, and are stimulated when the virus expresses antigens, uh, leads to a situation where you have a balance between the virus producing antigens and trying to produce particles and the T cells of the immune surveillance system noticing them and shutting it down. So immune su surveillance, I guess, in this type of situation can allow low level production of virus particles from apparently normal epithelium throughout a lifetime. If immune suppression occurs at some point in a person's life, then uh, the virus can get away with expressing more and we have the possibility of reactivation from latency as immune surveillance declines. So we can think about this type of balance between the virus and the host when a viral, um, a viral infection is controlled. And presumably this is what is happening in the beta papillomavirus, which are infecting us in many body sites. And this is why children become infected with beta papillomaviruses very early in their life. So how can this possibly relate to the cervix? Is this something that happens with alpha papillomavirus infections of the cervix? Well, it's a very difficult study to, a very difficult hypothesis to resolve, a difficult hypothesis to work out. But we've tried to do this by collecting hysterectomy samples from individuals who previously had HPV infections. And I just want to show you the results of a study which we've uh, recently submitted for publication. And in this study, we collected 100 hysterectomy samples from individuals who had had hysterectomies for reasons that had nothing to do with HPV. And this shows the age distribution of all the patients in our study. And we tested them to see if any of these hysterectomy services had HPV in them. And we found some did. In fact, we found around 17 had HPV in them. And actually in some of them, we found the HPV was also detectable in the smear of the person before the hysterectomy was taken. And you'll notice we found smear positivity generally in the older women. And the type of analysis we did on these, these 17 normal cervical pieces of cervical tissue was to try and identify what the virus was doing and why these cervical tissues were HPV positive. And we did this using the RNA in situ approach, which I showed earlier. 
So I just want to remind you now of the RNA expression pattern that we find if there's a productive infection. And this is now shown with the green spots on the blue background. This shows the odd basal cell now and again expressing, in this case, E7, and cells in the upper layers of the epithelium supporting genome amplification and expressing E7. Now, the pattern we see with E7 is actually similar to the pattern we see with E2. E7 drives phenotype, E2 doesn't change the phenotype, but the E2 protein is necessary for replication of the viral genome. And when we looked at these these cervical epithelium here from the patients who were HPV positive, we found this pattern of RNA expression when we used a probe to E2. So it was a little bit different than we find during productive infection, but he ranged in these different individuals a different age from just very low expression in the basal and parabasal cells to expression in the basal layer and some expression in the upper layers. And this starts to look a little bit like a productive infection, but not quite. And we get the idea, this is a virus infection which is now under control of the immune system. And one suggestion here that immune surveillance is actually controlling the ability of the virus to go through its life cycle and keeping the virus suppressed. And curiously, in one of the lesions here from the very oldest person, we actually found there was a micro lesion it was a very large cone biopsy in one or two small areas. We got these little places where the virus was expressing its proteins and making E4 and L1. So this gives us an idea that cervical infections may also be controlled in the way that other HPV infections are controlled. And this gives us a basically our current thinking of how virus papillomaviruses may actually work following infection of the epithelium. So let's summarize all the things I've said. Papillomaviruses, high-risk papillomaviruses are sexually transmitted. Infection occurs in the 20s, usually controlled by the immune system. And I think the idea is that memory T cells and immune surveillance will control infection thereafter for a person's life. And there may be clearance, but there may also be control. And this is a, a form of latency where the virus can be reactivated later in life. And the suggestion really is that this is suppression of viral gene expression by the immune system. This leads us to think that perhaps some of the detection in individuals who don't have new sexual activity is a consequence of changes in HB um, DNA quantity as the immune system changes. And it may be called reactivation of latency or just variations in the ability of the virus to complete its life cycle as the immune background changes. We also have the idea that if there is an immune failure, if the immune system can't clear the virus, and this may be because a person is unable to because of their genetic background, or it may be because just by chance they fail to clear infection, then over time, a low-grade disease can progress to a high-grade disease, can progress to cancer. And this is the standard model which we've had for many years. But we also have to think that as some epithelial sites, infection can cause high-grade neoplasia from the start. And I'm thinking that at the oropharynx and at certain parts of the cervix, this is probably what happens. And when we think about the anatomy of the cervix, well, there are many different types of epithelium of the cervix from the ectocervix to the transformation zone to areas where metaplasia is occurring through the endocervix and the endometrium. And many of these sites can be affected and infected by papillomaviruses and the consequences are likely to be different. And these can be manifest when they look at viral gene expression differences or when we use surrogates such as P16. But I think we have to think the cervical cancer is actually many different cancers uh, which can arise all together from the ectocervix, the transformation zone, from metaplastic tissue or from other sites. And that by understanding cervical cancer at this level, we'll have a better understanding of what biomarkers mean, what biomarkers can tell us, and may eventually get some better idea of the prognostic significance of using biomarkers or biomarker combinations in predicting who may go on to progress cancer from the early stage disease. 
So there's a lot of things I've, I've said there, and I've shown you a lot of different pictures. And of course, over the, the years, many people have contributed to the accumulation of this data. So I'll just mention a few of the people here without giving them my name. And you can see we're dependent on our studies on the, the great clinical collaborators we've had over the years. Um, and I'll say thank you very much for your attention. And if there's time, I'll try and answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. That was terrific. Um, we've got questions on the question and answer um, box. And uh, one of them is, uh, is there a defined set of E-Star versions, E16 products? And I assume the basis of that question is anything specific uh, that's linking to progression? Um, well, I wouldn't say, I, I think the, the real analysis of where different viral gene products are expressed in different precursor lesions hasn't really been done at enough detail yet. And I think you can only really get to that when you take different disease pathologies and you try very hard to overlay uh, with in situ analysis what's happening with the different gene products. And I think from my point of view, I would suggest the levels of E7 matter, but also the levels of E6, because E6 is affecting cell density and differentiation. And there are probably different disease manifestations which are directly related to how the extent of expression of these different proteins. And when you come to E6 star and the whole series of, yeah, I would say it's not really understood. And the whole role of some of these other spliced of viral products such as these six star proteins in uh, in controlling uh, cervical neoplasia, I guess, is not really very well understood. Does, does that? And there's um, another quite interesting question, and this one's from Diane Harper, and I have to say it reflects much of the thinking I have because years ago when uh, we didn't have PCR and we used to look for HPV by southern blotting. We actually identified in most of our hysterectomy sex, uh, segments, uh, sections rather, that uh, we, could, we could find HPV-16 and everybody said that was because we didn't know how to do southern blots. But um, it's age related. And so the issue is, is, there, is this to do with, the, with immune, I wouldn't say suppression, but immunity dropping a bit around about the menopause, because as Dan points out, estrogen may be really rather important yeah. here. We haven't even looked at hormonal control. Well, I mean, I think, I think some of these areas you mentioned are actually very big areas of study. And we, it's the tip of the iceberg where we are. Um, Age-related immune differences, I mean, I suspect they're very important. And, and when we did our hysterectomy study, curiously, we found HPV positivity in the smears, usually in the older people. And that was statistically significant, even though we only had a small number. Um, I think the local microenvironment that the virus finds itself in, and this is the immune environment and probably also the hormonal environment, probably has quite a big impact on what the disease pathology is, um, and even to the level of whether a SIN1 one, a SIN one is manifest as either a SIN1 or starts to look more like a SIN2 or a SIN1, uh, the local hormone environment could, could cause some variability of that from week to week and month to month. I've got no data, it's just what I suspect. And, and no, I think there's a lot of clinic, great clinical work that can be done here. Yeah. From I agree. scientists who really want to pile in on this with their beautiful collection of material and to use some of these things, these, these methods. There's also a question from Michelle Osborne. Um, and she's really asking, it's a technical question. Can you be sure that you're looking at um, RNA gene products with your um, in situ expression? You know, is it, is it actually expression or is it? is it DNA presence? Well, I, I think we have to be careful with that. Um, I think when you're looking at the basal layer, we're always very careful with our RNA in situ probes to make sure we look in as spots in the cytoplasm. So the DNA will be exclusively in the nucleus. 
And when we see spots in the nucleus, that can be uh, um, unprocessed RNAs or mRNAs which haven't gone out or DNA. Admittedly, when we do this, we do lots of controls with DNAs to try and eliminate this. But when you've got genome amplification, there's just so much DNA there. I wouldn't like to be sure what we're looking at. When we're in the basal layer, we can be very careful to say our signals in the cytoplasm. And we can look at normal tissue as well, and we can do lots of other things. And to be honest, picking up DNA is incredibly hard in the basal layer. Um, and not all our probes are different. So uh, if we take an E1 probe, we won't see much. And if we take a URR reverse probe, we won't see much. So um, they're, they're good controls for the DNA because the long control region gets the DNA if it's a cross reactivity. But these are, you can see with appropriate controls, I think you, you're okay, but you have to be careful, yeah. Um there's, there's a question from um, Enrique Bocardo, which I think is quite important. When you're looking at latency, is it really latency as you see with herpes viruses? Could it be just persistence and replication and where permissive conditions are available? Um, and I think yeah. the animals actually tell yeah. you the story here very clearly. Well, maybe you know the answer better, better than me, but. I, I would say latency is a just a version of the immune surveillance. Um, and I would say if you've got a very good immune response and good T cell response, you force the virus to only be there where it's invisible to the immune system. And so the only place he can hang out anymore is in the basal cells. And if, if you consider a normal productive infection, you consider other chronic infections like EBV, which maybe you know more about than me, but you know, the idea is the basal cell is a, it's, it's a latent reservoir, you know, in a productive infection, the, the basal cell doesn't have to, have to express very much at all. You are actually keeping the viral genome at low copy number and in low grade, if you ever do an in situ, which we've done recently for HPV2 or HPV11, there's virtually nothing going on that is easily detectable in the basal layer of a condyloma or, or a normal HPV2 wart. Um, and so they don't need, so, you know, they almost go back, they force back by the immune system to the, you could regard it as a, like, like EBV, you have a latent reservoir in a B cell and you require differentiation to be productive. So it's a slightly, it's a slight twist in the way of thinking, but not very much. And then the basal cell is the latent reservoir um, and you need differentiation to be productive. Um, so then the question would be is what kickstarts the uh, quiescent genome into active replication? Yeah, um, I think it's all down to cunning gene expression transcriptional control. I think I think when we look at, we've looked recently at immunosuppressed individuals actually, uh, and we, we get quite a few odd insights. One of them being, we did a group, with a group in Paris, we looked at a tree man, the HPV2. And even in completely immune, or people with very poor immune system, you can still get productive warts with very little basal activity. And it makes you wonder whether there are even, you know, generally this, this problematic cell type where gene expression can be high sometimes and the virus actually doesn't go bonkers in the basal cell. It, so, yeah, I think there's a lot more to, I think, I think they very, they are tuned to their epithelial site and they tune to particular epithelial cells. And I'm, I'm sort of, don't know the answers now, but I'm thinking there's a lot more complexity to the 200 types and the different epithelial backgrounds. Well, there are a couple of comments on the, the question and answer chat from Vinnie Bonagora and Betty Steinberg. That's quite worrying. They'll have great questions. <laughs> uh, they probably know better than me. Well, I mean, the, the, the studies from, uh, from their group, but particularly in the um, in RRP and in the respiratory tract, I yeah. think uh, established that latency is a yeah. real event yeah. in in uh, human HPV, which has been disputed, strongly disputed, but I think it's uh, their, their yeah. work. And even, and Betty of course showed latency transcripts. So- Yes, yes. 
I agree. And that, those transcripts make a lot of sense with what we see. And to be honest, having recently looked at problematic condylomas, uh, if Betty's listening, we, we would love to get some RRP lesions now. We, we're overdue. And uh, yeah, if you've got any, please put them in the post. Um, now then, I, if you, can you see your Q&A box, John? Is there anything particular in there that you want to respond to? I, I can't. To? I've, lost, I've lost track of where it is, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, I, Nick Parham has asked a couple of questions. And one is, what controls the deregulation of E6, E7 expression? Because this seems to be able to happen. I think he's saying, is this con deregulation confined to the basal layer when you've got a flat ward? Or can you deregulate at any level in the epithelium and result in um, uh, the neoplastic um, progression starting? Yeah, no, I don't, I, to be honest, I don't really know the answer, answer to that. I, I assume, as, as far as I can tell, it's the deregulation in the basal layer, which is most important. To, as far as I can see. Um, yeah, I, I would, um, would agree with I you. Mean, there. You know, I think when you look at those first two pictures of the high and low risk infection, I think there is, there is a difference between some of those high risk, uh, high grade lesions, in that I think when HPV 16 causes a high grade neoplasia, you get a lot of expression in the basal layer with this slow slope off as you go into yeah. the higher layers. And it's, if you get genome amplification under that situation, it's not proper genome amplification. The virus is trying hard and not really doing very well. The real genome amplification is where you, it goes down and then comes back massively. Um, so I, I, I think trying to understand the, the change in expression in the different layers, I mean, people have already started to do this and there, there are there are some very nice molecular studies showing how promoter activity changes in the upper layers but it's it's not particularly well understood and things like the late promoter control are not very well understood and linking splicing patterns to the different layers of the epithelium has been very hard work so uh, it's oh. if we could understand all that it would be fantastic well, John, time is moving on, and I can only thank you for a fantastic talk. And I think it's it's explained lots of things to people, but it's also told us that there's a lot to do still and a lot to understand. So thank you again very much for doing this. Okay, thank you very and much. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. <laughs>